John, it's nice to meet you. Uh, my name is Devin Smith. I'm currently an investor on the Silverthread Capital Partners team here in Boston. Uh, it's great to finally meet you and connect and, and speak on the podcast. Devin, thanks so much for finding time to join us on the Abbey Podcast on this uh, Wednesday Wednesday afternoon. I, the, re- the 28th. The reason I mentioned the date and the time of the day is because a lot of our listeners, uh, we had some feedback in terms of not being able to place that particular conversation in the date yeah. and time it was happening. Yeah. We talk a lot about trends and things like that. And sometimes I guess people feel like they're maybe a little bit behind. So that's that's for that. Can you, before we jump into talking about your current role, your current company, give us a thumbnail version of your career timeline and background. Yeah, for sure. Happy to do that. I'm so relatively early in my career from a timing perspective, but I uh, graduated from Morehouse College back in 2018, uh, which is a historically black college in, or university down in Atlanta, Georgia. I majored in finance there, uh, having done a couple internships throughout my time at Goldman Sachs, at Blackstone, and at Herman Capital Management, all of which were all targeted towards my end goal, which was to work in financial services post-grad. I was fortunate enough to get a return offer from Blackstone after interning there my junior summer and joined full-time in in the summer of 2018, uh, where I worked for a little over two and a half years, uh, working on a strategic partners team there, uh, which was focusing on... uh, an amalgamation of different things from secondary investing to co-investing to impact investing. I was doing kind of all those things as a generalist, uh, but realized that I really liked the direct equity component of the, in sort of the growth space, uh, which is what prompted me to move uh, to my current role at Silversmith, uh, which I just started in, in January of this year. Well, that's super exciting. Quite a, quite a journey you had so far. Yeah. And when um, coming out of, you know, while you were in college and obviously you had some pretty successful internships, yep. tell us a little bit more about that process. Um, good deal of our listeners are early stage career professionals. And that's a big question for a lot of folks that are just coming out of school or maybe it's, you know, they pivoting in, you know, in careers. Um, how, you know, how, share, share, share any insight on some of the strategies that really helped you land some of these uh, really awesome gigs part of your industry. For sure. And, and I know the process in terms of recruiting has changed a little bit since I was in school, even though that was only three years ago. But, you know, I think that the biggest, uh, you know, sort of advantage that I had going to Morehouse was that there were a ton of people who had come before me who had worked in financial services. And so I think that the biggest way to, to really prepare yourself for the interview process, for the, the super days, for the coffee chats, whatever it may be, is to just reach out to your network and really just ask them, what types of questions were you asked? How should I prepare? You know, how do I nail my 30 second pitch? All of which are very important when you're thinking about actually securing either an internship or a full-time role post-grad. Um, I think that, you know, I have a younger brother who's going through this process now and even talking to him, he's recruiting for a full year and a half in advance in terms of an internship. So he's recruiting for summer 2022 internships as a college sophomore, which is crazy to think about. Uh, and so I think that even more so nowadays, the, the onus is on the actual individual to do the prep themselves. There are numerous resources out there, uh, whether it's, you know, looking online and, and Googling, you know, how do I prepare for an investment banking interview or how do I prepare for a private equity interview all the way to, like I said earlier, just leveraging the network and leveraging anyone you can find on LinkedIn uh, who could help you with that process. That's a great advice. And at the end of the day, it's a contact sport. Uh, there's a there's a really good quote that a good friend of mine recently mentioned to me, which resonated so well. It's it's not about what you know, and it's not about who you know. It's all about who you know, what you know. So yeah. In yeah. a sense, it's it's a combination of both, of and that they just resonate so well with me. Yeah. Um. So moving on a little bit further to kind of where you at right now. Yep. Tell us a little bit more about your current role and what falls under your purview, your area of responsibility. For sure. And so I'm currently an investor on the Silversmith Capital Partners team. We call everyone investors who are on the investment side of the firm. Uh, Technically speaking, my title is associate Um, from a more hierarchical hierarchical perspective. um, I just joined in January, but my roles and responsibilities differ depending on the week and on, on the day. I'd say that probably 40% of my roles and responsibilities are surrounding sourcing. So actually proactively finding companies within my targeted vertical. So I spend the majority of my time in healthcare IT and healthcare services. 
and a little bit more of my time, you know, kind of the 20% of my time I'd say was spent on what we call content and creative. So think about, you know, developer tools, video gaming, uh, you know, architectural design tools, anything that doesn't fit into the traditional, uh, you know, structure of Silversmith kind of goes into our content and creative side of, of the business. Um, and so I spend a little bit of time sourcing there. Uh, and so that's, you know, proactively speaking with CEOs, entrepreneurs, founders, and identifying interesting companies that could be potential investment opportunities for Silversmith. And I'd say the other 60% of my time is probably spent actually doing deal execution. So once we source companies and find interesting opportunities for the firm, we have to do a, a ton of due diligence to make sure that it's a viable investment for us and that it will not only be successful in the near term, but also in the long term. And so a lot of that, you know, is centered around actually doing the, the due diligence and, and the financial analysis surrounding these businesses. Very exciting, which, you know, you couldn't have set me up any better for the next segment that I want to cover with you. It's the kind of the, the fun part of our conversation is, is explaining the roles at a typical or standard venture capital firm to a yep. five-year role, to a, to a three-year role. Yeah. The reason I ask that is because I have a three, three-year three old and a seven-year old. Yeah. And a lot of times we talk a lot about that. So kind of the kind of the the little bit of a fast paced explanation from a standpoint of how would you explain the role of a GP or an MP to a five year old? What would be your take on that? Yeah. And so I think what it boils down to, John, is, is really just the experience. And so I think that when you're thinking about a general partner or a managing partner at a firm like Silversmith, I think we all have a similar goal in mind, which is to find the best companies to invest in, to diligence them with extreme scrutiny and detail, and ultimately to, to not only generate returns for our LPs, uh, but to also really help our founders and entrepreneurs grow. And so I'd say that the managing partners and the general partners, given that they have 20 plus years of experience within the field, you know, can really identify not only key industries of interest, key trends in the space, but also help us in terms of leveraging their network. And so I think that what's really crucial and critical for a general partner or a managing partner is to be able to do the reference checks and the reference calls on, on founders and entrepreneurs to really understand, you know, what businesses will do well in the current climate in a COVID-19 environment and which ones won't do so well. And, and even coming out of that in the next couple of months, how will businesses transition back to a more normal setting? Um, and so that, I think that that's kind of one of the responsibilities. I think that another responsibility for the managing partners and the general partners is to make sure that the underlying team is really able to help contribute at every stage of the process. And so I think what Silversmith does a really good job of, and a lot of, you know, this might differ at, at other firms across the street, is they really make sure that everyone's voice is heard. Silversmith, when we, ever, we go to investment committee, all 23 investment professionals are in the room. We are all contributing. We all vote on whether or not the deal gets done. It's not a five to seven person investment committee that you might see at other firms everyone has a stake in the game. And I think that that is a differentiating factor that our managing partners and general partners here really wanted to, to hold true to, to our culture. I think that another responsibility for them is of course sourcing. Sometimes they're gonna hear of, of companies that you know I would never hear of as an associate just based on their robust network that they've developed over the past 20 to 25 years in the industry. Um, and they've also got connections and, and relationships directly with CEOs, with founders, with entrepreneurs. That have probably been developed, you know, from the college days or the the, the post, you know, the kind of the MBA days, uh, and now they're they're starting or working at established companies that we can potentially invest in. So I think that they've got a, a, a three pronged approach here: it's sourcing, it's helping out with the diligence, and then it's also just making sure uh, that the overall team is is happy and feels included, and making sure that everyone's voice is heard when it comes to the actual diligence process. Very cool. So almost like equivalent of the CEO in that of course, typical company. Of course. Yep. Now, mm -hmm. That's great. That's great explanation. So when we talk about kind of the career path, if one, if one was to choose going down the VC route, of course. Uh, you told us a little bit about your background in terms of the internships at the financial institutions or the, yes. you know, whatever the case may be at the banking you know, sector or the financial in general. Yep. Uh, from career path perspective, is that a pretty, pretty typical path when you start out, you intern at you know, financial institutions and then you kind of you cut your teeth from, from that perspective, go into the investor role, progressing through principal, associate, and then getting to the partner level. Right. Yeah. And so I think 
you know, like, like you said, I, I think that the most typical trajectory nowadays is still to do the financial services internships, to start off full time in either a traditional private equity or uh, investment banking role straight out of college. And that will usually position you pretty well to get into a venture capital investing role uh, or a growth equity role, like I sit in today. You know, I think um, with that being said, there are, of course, alternative routes to, to being a venture investor. I don't think that you necessarily have to have the prerequisite two years of investment banking experience to do so. I think, you know, people who come from a consulting background or come from a nonprofit background or come from an ed education background to serve, you know, varying roles and responsibilities in the venture capital environment. So I think that there's, if you look out there today, there's ed tech focused VCs, right? And so someone with a background in education would probably be a good fit for that. You know, there's healthcare focused VCs as well. So someone with a, a medical background could be a great fit for that role. Um, and then there's general just, you know, like, like I said, there's, there's uh, sort of funds that focus on consumer base and consumer focus um, uh, products as well. So if someone has a marketing background or a consulting background, that could be a good fit there. So I don't think that there's any sort of formula anymore uh, for really getting into venture capital investing. And even if you're not working at a big firm, like you, like we talked about earlier, there's the opportunity to be an angel investor too. And that allows people who might sit in different fields to really get their hands dirty and, and, and really network with founders and, and help, you know, inflict change, uh, you know, in the overall community. Yeah, that's a very good point. You know, and that's exactly what I'm doing. It's yeah. transitioning from kind of the owner operator founder yep. to leveraging these lessons learned and that experience now helping other entrepreneurs and founders kind of what are some of the things that worked for me or did not work. And then also kept helping them from the financial standpoint as well. And, you know, you mentioned something, the whole concept of value add investor. Right. You see that everywhere. It's, you know, every firm, every investor tries to, you know, position themselves as that right. value add investor. But it's a different sentiment from the founder community in general that, yeah. you know, there's a lot of the industry analysis that's being done lately in terms of, understanding the the semantics between that relationship and i would just say you know for the most part it's somewhat it's somewhat inconsistent and somewhat negative almost to the extent where founders view uh investors the venture capital even angels from that perspective as not so much of a value add from the overall perspective so when it comes to that particular concept what are some of the things that really help you as an investor or your firm to kind of to break that mold and really establish yourself as someone who is delivering value beyond just the financial support? What are some of the things that you do on day to day basis that as you partner with founders that really, you know, help deliver value? Yeah, so I think step one is really to ask the founders kind of what they're looking for in a partner and how they want to achieve their next stage of growth. So I think that that's kind of step one here is we really like to operate on the entrepreneur and the founder's part. If they've got a two-year growth plan that they want to stick to, we want to do whatever it takes to help them achieve that two-year goal. Whether it's a two-year, three-year, four-year, five-year goal, we want to do whatever the founder wants to do and do it on their time and how they want to do it. So that's step one and being a value-add investor in my opinion. Number two is I think at least from our perspective, we only focus on healthcare IT and services and just, you know, SaaS and information systems, right? And so when thinking about it from that perspective, we have developed a certain amount of domain expertise as it relates to the two core verticals of the firm. You know, when we're thinking about it from that perspective, we can be a value add investor specifically to healthcare IT and healthcare services companies because we've done it numerous times. We've got a proven track record of getting companies from seven, eight, nine, 10 million of ARR, all the way up to 200 plus. And we've got a good track record of helping those founders really realize those growth plans that they had put in place four or five years ago when we first invested. And so I'd really say that, you know, first and foremost, you've got to have the experience and the exposure. You know, we've got that domain expertise that I mentioned earlier, which I think helps us quite a bit. I think second, you really need to make sure that you're doing what the founder and the entrepreneur really feels is best for the business invest for the business at this given time, because if you are butting heads consistently, you'll never make any progress, you know, from a growth perspective and even from a relationship perspective down the road. And then I think, you know, last but not least, being able to tap into your network and, and being able to tap into you know, any potential customers for your, for those, you know, entrepreneurs or those founders or those new companies that you're investing in, 
is crucial and critical and, and even helping them with, with simple things like thinking about you know, bringing on a new CLO or a new CFO or organizing, using a new accounting software to help organize the books, whatever it may be, having that you know, ability to tap in and leverage previous experiences that you dealt with to help these new companies that you're investing in or looking to invest in, I think is critical to the, the development of, of the new business that you're looking to build. Yeah, very good points. And it all boils down to really having that leverage or that that domain expertise in a particular area that you're investing in. Mm -hmm. um, and I can definitely attest to that because when I was originally starting out in angel investing, that was one of my main challenges is also yeah. what direction I want to go. And it all boiled down to where's my main domain expertise? What have I done before in the past? What have I you know, built myself and taking that knowledge and then trying to use that when working with the founders and really helping them through that path. And one thing that you mentioned at the beginning, which is very simple, but powerful and oftentimes overlooked is actually listening to yeah. the founder needs and yeah. let them actually, you know, tell you what, what are some of the areas that they need help in. Right. A lot of times I see, you know, investors and, you know, other, um, other firms just trying to dive right in and almost dictate their own playbook, which right. is I think a recipe for disaster. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> Couldn't agree more. <laughs> For sure, for sure. Um, so moving a little bit further, as you evaluate potential companies or founders to invest in, um, some of the early indicators of that product market fit, can you share with us a little bit further, where, what, are, what are some of those indicators that really give you certain signals that this is a potential interest or this, you know, this, this piques my, my attention that I want to move a little bit further? Share with us any of those metrics or any any indicators that uh, you like to zero in on. Yeah, so look, I think, you know, we like to take a, a higher level view first and foremost when thinking about, you know, looking at potential, uh, you know, products that, that would fit into an end market that we think is interesting. And so, you know, we do a lot of things that we call blueprints, which are effectively analyzing certain areas of the marketplace. So think about, you know, data interoperability for healthcare or think about, you know, user generated content for, for content and creative, things like that. We like to take a higher level view, understand the key trends and the key drivers of your, these respective marketplaces, and then look for some of the interesting companies that we see, you know, that fit into our mandate. I'd say that then once we actually identify some of those businesses, what we actually what we look for, you know, from an actual product market fit is we, we do a lot of customer calls and a lot of customer reference calls and user calls. And so first and foremost, if we find a company that's interesting, we'll hop on the phone with some potential customers and we'll do them blinded so that they don't know who we are and they don't know what company we're looking to potentially invest in. But that gives you a good indication of whether or not the product is actually liked by the end users. So that's step number one for us. I think once we get past that, we, we really look at the, the implementation plan as well. So we think about you know, how long does it take for a potential customer to get online and get ramped up. And so if that's a, a 12 to, to 16 week sales cycle, that might be a little long for us, right? But six to eight weeks for someone to implement a new software, a new technology is great. And so if that's, you know, if that coincides with great customer reviews about the entire process, about the product and about the end use cases, well, that, that's a pretty good signal for, for a good product in terms of the market that we're looking to be in. I'd say then we have to think about, you know, kind of more, more numerical analyses, so thinking about retention. And so you wanna see, you know, of the customers that this business is potentially signing up for, for the new product or platform, how many of them are actually staying on for renewed contracts versus how many are, are churning or are leaving the, are leaving the business and, and moving on to other products. And that's another key metric that we like to use. We like to also think about, you know, one of the key, uh, you know, metrics that a lot of people try and calculate, which is often difficult to view is, Thinking about lifetime value of respective customers when you're thinking about some of the content and creative companies we're investing in, and thinking about how much it actually costs to acquire those customers, or we call it we call it CAC, um, or customer acquisition cost. And so, you know, thinking about all of these different metrics, we can kind of start to triangulate and think about whether or not this product is one that that actually fits within the end market that we think is interesting, and we can start to think about whether or not it's worth doing a deeper dive into the actual the product itself, thinking about, you know, the actual financials, thinking about the growth trajectory, thinking about implementation plans, just thinking about the, the, the end use case and market expansion for specific products. Uh, but you have to kind of do some high level, more, 
you know, overarching analyses first that are more qualitative before you can start to really dive into the quantitative stuff. Yeah, very interesting. And like you've mentioned, having that blueprint, having some type of a framework yep. that you can follow along, I think that really maximizes your your chances of minimizing certain risks, so to right. say. Right. And as we move on from, you know, evaluating the product market fit or those all those early indicators, as part of that process, I'm pretty sure you guys, you you follow a certain formula, so to say, to evaluate the founders. Uh, yeah. When we talk about uh, founder market fit, so to say, and their abilities to succeed in a particular area that they're looking to build this product or service, what are some of the things that you look for when you evaluate the founders? Yeah, and so you know, one of the, the key or critical parts of the silver mandate is we look for bootstrap companies at time of investment. And so we like to say that if a founder with limited resources can develop a company that's generating eight to $10 million of ARR, that has a clear path to profitability and that is growing at 20 plus percent, seems like a pretty, that should be a clear indicator of whether or not that's a, that's a good entrepreneur or a good founder for us. And so that's kind of step one is we like and we prefer bootstrap companies. And so, you know, we really like to also think about the three to five year plan of, of this you know, entrepreneur or founder as well. If it's clearly thought out, if they've got, you know, clear, you know, performance indicators that will allow them to me measure their success and their progress at the six month mark, the 12 month mark, 18 month mark, et cetera, that's also a good sign usually for the way that they're thinking about the next stage of development and growth for the business. We'd also like to, to make sure that the founder wants to stay on and that they're not just looking to, to take some sort of secondary capital off the table uh, and, and just achieve some sort of liquidity. We really wanna make sure that the founder is committed to developing the business and that this is their, their true brainchild and something that they're really looking to grow with us um, and that we can grow with them. Um, but, but you know, I think that you know, some of the criteria that we really think about, you know, once again, are looking at the amount of resources that a founder has used to help get to where they are today. Like I said, with bootstrap companies, usually it's very limited resources. Um, we also like to do, you know, reference checks, of course, and, and just make sure that, you know, the people that we're, that we're dealing with are, are who they say they are and, and that they have positive reputations across the street and across, uh, you know, kind of the industry. And, and so that's a critical component too. And what I think last but not least is we like to meet our founders or entrepreneurs in person, which has been a little bit difficult in the COVID-19 environment uh, but hopefully as things start to open up in the next couple of months, we can start to make, you know, in-person visits. And so, you know, whether it's us sitting six feet away from someone over coffee, you know, that's still critical to us. And, and whether we're wearing masks, you know, or not in that environment, we really do like to meet our founders and entrepreneurs in person at least once or twice, if not more. Um, and we view that as a critical component and a critical element of our, of our process of evaluating founders. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great uh, framework when it yeah. comes to analyzing and evaluating the founders. Something just I wanted to add to that that really kind of at least helped me when yep. I when I talk to potential founders is what I've noticed: those that are very successful have have this unique ability to to clearly communicate and articulate their thoughts right. more specifically around what what they don't know. Uh, because it's right. very easy to say, here's everything that I know and here's everything that I'm good at. But for a founder to really have that, have very clear self-awareness of some of the areas where they're lacking or where they need help with, I think it's also very unique. And also some of the early indicators in founders, I found when you talk to them about, let's say their early, early days when they were in college or they were in high school and, you know, things like, did you join the club or did you actually build a club? Right. Uh, things like that. Or, I mean, I've, I've heard somewhere in one of the other podcasts, someone talked about the navigator versus the cartographer analogy, where you have a founder who is following the map or a cartographer who is actually creating the map right. Right. for others to for others to 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 follow. Right. And just last but not least, one question that I thought was really, really unique when I was part of an evaluation committee, someone had asked a founder, if they were, they had the magic formula, the magic pill to rank number one in Google search, which category would they choose? And why is that? And having that ability to articulate whether it's an existing category or something that they're looking to create, I think that's a unique balance to, to be able to have that conversation. For sure. Yeah. I think, you know, 
understanding and acknowledging the things that you don't know well are also, like you said, a critical component to the process because that's usually a void that we hope that we can fill and we can help that founder achieve, you know, some sort of expertise or knowledge about that respective area. Um, and, and, and if you can mix that with a, a founder that has a true, you know, plan in place for their, their overall product or business, I think that you kind of create a slam dunk combination there, uh, you know, when you have, you know, all the elements that you need to put together. Right, right, right absolutely. No, you framed that very well. <laughs> uh, and it's from the bootstrapping perspective, it's really yeah. someone who is, you know, with basically no resources, yep. being able to build something from ground up, I think it's, it's, it's a very unique skill set. And it's also recognizing that as the company grows and scales, I found also a lot of founders sometimes struggle where they are not you know, necessarily able to lead the large teams, but that also comes back to their clarity of thought around having the gaps, having, having certain weaknesses and being open to, to, that, to, that, you know, to that learning. I think that's right. very important. Right. Um, when, when, we, when we talk, well, you mentioned that you focus on healthcare, IT, and you also dive into like content creation space. Right. Share with us what other areas that are very interesting to you. What are some of the trends that you are observing these days? Um, cu curious to to get your take on some of the things that uh you know that are on your radar. Yeah. Um, so you know, I think you know, outside of what I'm seeing in healthcare IT and healthcare services and kind of in the content creative space, you know, there's been what I've seen outside of our immediate focus in content creative is this focus on user-generated content. So people you know, had, have, had previously overlooked user-generated content and then kind of not really thought about the way that that plays a huge role in, in what we see on you know, various advertising platforms or mediums or what we see on our social media you know, streams or our platforms as well. And there's this whole new industry coming up where people are able to leverage the content that they create, whether it's a simple, you know, video of them skating or surfing or, you know, playing an instrument or whatever, they can then monetize that. And there are certain platforms that are allowing people uh, to, to kind of bridge the gap between the actual user who's creating the content and the end purchaser of the content or the advertiser or the, you know, let's say the Ford, the GM who's looking for someone who's playing, you know, country music in the back of their, their Ford F-150 or whatever, you know, all the way to someone who's, you know, surfing, you know, waves in California for a billabong or a Hurley or, you know, one of those type of commercials too, someone can actually generate that content using a, a smartphone, a camera, whatever it may be, and now monetize that. And so I think that there's going to be a huge trend of people who, you know, have access to these simple tools like a camera, uh, who can then simply take that and sell the product to a marketer, to an ad agency, to someone along those lines to not only generate a new advertising opportunity for these respective end companies, but also give some sort of monetary compensation to the user. That's really cool to me. I think that there's a couple of platforms that are starting to do that, that I won't mention because I, I think they're interesting for us. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of a new, a new trend that I'm seeing um, that I'm following a lot. Another one is kind of within the, is kind of a little bit of a niche thing, but also content creative related is, the architectural design space. So a lot of, you can now use a lot of 3D rendering tools and in different ways and technologies to really think about designing spaces and designing um, you know, atmospheres or environments that people would, would think are conducive to achieving work or, or achieving you know, a good living environment, whatever it may be. There are these new applications and platforms that are allowing people to actually manage the entire uh, process. So thinking about actually scouting or, 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 or planning a building and thinking about the actual design and where to put doors and windows, et cetera, all the way to managing the actual construction itself. So you can actually put your contractors and subcontractors on the platform and that will allow them to check in and check off on tasks and things like that, you know, all the way to the, the actual management of the property, thinking about things like, you know, electricity usage, water usage, consumption, things like that at the end. And, and so, so it's a full product suite that allow people who are, you know, architects, designers, construction workers to really all be aligned on one platform, which I think is pretty cool. And so there's a couple of companies doing that in the US and in Europe uh, that are starting to, to really shape that trend in terms of 
workflow and product management and development uh, across interior and exterior space. Those are two cool things that I think are interesting. Not very cool. I'm happy to talk about healthcare trends and, and, and other general trends, but you let me know what you want to, what direction you want to go in. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. No, and I appreciate you sharing, um, especially when you mentioned something around D2C direct to consumer and the platform, because for me, what's really interesting lately is looking at the companies that are starting out as a product, so to see, you know, whether that's B2B or D2C, but the end vision is building a platform that right. really enables the users around that particular product. As an example, you know, Facebook started out as a social network, but then became a platform. Right. Same thing with, with Apple and the iPhone started out as a product, became this ecosystem of a right. platform for others to, to work on. Right. You know, Salesforce, another great example, started out as a CRM, became that platform for developers. Right. Which, you know, those I can definitely resonate being very interesting space for the companies that are building something um, around that. So yeah. that's very cool. Um, when, you know, as far as, you know, looking at the overall kind of that evaluation process and the investment criteria or, you know, looking at the PMF or evaluating your founders, yep. what other elements that, you know, you pay attention to, wh whether that's the market size or unique technologies, share with us anything that, you know, in addition to what we have discussed that really help you make sound decisions when you decide to invest or not? Yeah, for sure. And I think that this is probably a, a very important for the healthcare side of the business, right? Because, you know, there's ever changing mandates and requirements surrounding healthcare and what you can and can't share and HIPAA regulations and, you know, what's compliant, what's not compliant. And even the, the, the simple things as, you know, transferring data from one party to another requires it to be sent in a certain form or using a certain platform. And so I think that one of the other things that we really pay attention to is the regulatory environment, especially on the healthcare side. So you have to constantly be thinking about, you know, what if, you know, X, Y, and Z department decides that you can no longer, you know, utilize this, this platform to send data from, you know, the, the physician to the whoever. Um, and so, you know, you have to really think about what's going on from a regulatory perspective. So that really came came into effect recently when we're thinking about this new fire mandate, which is just a new way of sending data, you know, amongst different parties within the healthcare ecosystem. But that's a new mandate that's rolling out in the next couple of months, um, if not, you know, in the next, if not in the months, a couple of years. And that's going to transform the way we think about data interoperability and the way that we think about the transfer of data in a healthcare setting. And so for that, you have to then think about are these legacy platforms going to be outdated? Are they going to be able to get up to speed for this new fire mandate that's coming into play? And if not, what are the companies going that are going to help them, you know, really succeed in that transition? And hey, maybe there's a couple that will, will allow them to seamlessly integrate their legacy systems into the new platform or the new mode of transport. And if that's the case, huh, those are going to be the clear winners in the next couple of years. And so I think we like to look at the regulatory environment, especially on the healthcare side, in addition to some of the things we mentioned earlier. I think we also like, you know, to actually talk to physicians and doctors and, and, and key stakeholders in the healthcare community, because, you know, who better to learn from, you know, than a physician on their pain points when it comes to serving a patient on a day-to-day -day basis and what they think could improve quality of care, uh, you know, for, for, a, for a specific patient. You know, why not go and talk to five physicians, you know, in person over coffee and say, hey, look, you know, you use X, Y, and Z product right now, which one could be done better? And if so, what would you do to make it better? And, and how would you do that? And then maybe we would go back and look and say, oh, this company is trying to improve this process for a doctor or a physician. Sure, that, that seems like a, a clear path winner. And so, look, I think there's more than just the, the high level things we mentioned earlier, you sometimes have to look at other sources and other mediums and modes to try and find, you know, clear winners and, and, and clear, uh, you know, changes and shifts in the way we think about what's going on now. Yeah, very interesting. And I'm pretty sure we could probably have an entire episode <laughs> dedicated to that, talking about your yeah. IT. I spent a few years working for um, one of the healthcare giants as, you know, running their IT division. And it's, right. 
I can't attest at how far behind that just industry in general yeah. with the rest of the, you know, the industries yeah. but when it comes to innovation, when it comes to technology, right. and there's just so much opportunity there for right. very simple things to fix through yeah. technology. I think it's, it's just unbelievable. So unbelievable. I, you know, I can definitely relate why you're choosing that, that particular <laughs> segment. Yeah. Um, Devin, share with us what's your content diet is looking like. What do you consume on daily basis? Uh, what are your sources for learning? Yeah, so yeah, that's an excellent question. I think you know one of the things that I try and do when I wake up is is read a couple of different news sources. And so whether that's little daily blurbs that come in, you know, from from Bloomberg or come in from the Wall Street Journal or from the New York Times, you know, that's usually a good way to, to to think about what I missed overnight and think about you know kind of what uh, you know what might be interesting in terms of topics or regulations or you know, just general reading that can make me smarter and, and make me more, uh, you know, relatable to, to founders or entrepreneurs. Um, I think another good, uh, you know, kind of resource that I like to use is TechCrunch. I like TechCrunch a lot because, you know, they always have some pretty interesting articles there, not only about fundraising and, and history, but also just thinking about conversations with entrepreneurs, CEOs, and founders about what they think is next in terms of innovation. So that's always a good medium or, that I like to use as well. Uh, and then PitchBook and it is pretty good too, as is, um, you know, there's a couple other ones that I get uh, that I get, I get sent to my email every morning that I try and read quickly that are just little snippets. But, you know, that's kind of my, those are my main sources of, of content. I usually read more so than watch. It's just easier for me. And I think that I retain a little bit better that way. But, um, you know, another thing that we like to do is I like to talk to my friends at other VC and, and PE and growth equity firms just to see what they're thinking about and how they approach different topics or situations and in and, and, and different industries or trends. And so that's kind of, you know, my content diet is both, you know, the print stuff as well as, uh, you know, just talking to other people. That's great. Love those resources. Definitely yeah. going to make them available in the episode notes. Yeah. And the question that I like to ask a lot of my guests is, how do you think this conversation went? Look, I think it, I think it went well, uh, John. I think we, we had a good conversation here. I think, you know, hopefully you got a better picture of what I do on a daily basis and, and on who Silversmith is as a firm. Um, you know, we're looking forward to the next 10, 15, 20 years of Silversmith Partners, given it's only been six so far. Um, you know, but, you know, I think it's a very good firm, a very good place to be. Uh, we've had some some great success with some of our portfolio companies, and we're looking forward to to helping our, our entrepreneurs and founders in the next stage of growth. So, you know, I think it went well. I hope hopefully you know some of the viewers and listeners can get some some good insight into what what's useful and what's not, and and, and hopefully this was beneficial not only for you and I but but for the viewers as well. Oh, for sure, and I can definitely attest to that. For me personally, it was very useful. Learned quite a bit, so I definitely appreciate all of the insights that you shared because I know a lot of that was, you know, somewhat borderline secret sauce or not. So yeah. I, you, you did a really great job formulating that, uh, at least from compartmentalizing, because a lot of the questions are pretty loaded that we right. we could talk for days about that. Right. Process. Right. And right. highlighting certain areas, I think it's a very, very unique skill set. So you should uh, should definitely be proud of that. And uh, I really appreciate your time today. We're definitely going to stay in touch and perhaps do another episode in the near future and see how much have changed and transpired. Yeah, let's, let's do that. Let's stay in touch. And the next time I'm down in Florida, we should definitely catch up. <laughs> 100%.